Uh, we've been looking at godly conflict. Conflicts are, avo- are unavoidable in life. So we've been looking at this. Okay. So uh, just let's get some, get some ideas going on here. Non-specifically, so don't give any specific examples. What area of your life has caused the most conflict for you? An area of your life. Sorry? Family? Yes, can very much so cause conflict. <laughs> I actually hear that a lot more than I would have thought that I would have, especially around Thanksgiving time. Huh? <laughs> uh, anybody else? Sorry? The tongue? Like opening your mouth? I got gotcha. you. Yeah, obviously not in your life, right? <laughs> the quietest guy in the church. <laughs> Uh, anybody else? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So I guess you could say your biggest area of conflict is you. <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. That's funny. <laughs> That's really funny. So it is, uh, it's is—it's definitely hard for many to accept conflict, and a lot of wrong things kind of get believed about conflict. Um, one wrong thing that be- is gets believed about conflict is that conflict is bad. It's not. So... Uh, some areas of life that I can think of is um, in, uh, family. It actually is one of those things I hear a crazy lot amount, and uh, especially because uh, at my last uh, my last ministry posting, I guess you could call it, uh, I worked with my dad and uh, and my mother <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> kind of got to be a ooh uh, It was an experience, <laughs> uh, but work really didn't cause me that much. Um, didn't really cause me that much. So th- there's a few things about conflict that I think we need to talk about. Matthew 18 is talking about how you're going to your brother and you're talking to them, brother or sister. You know, it's not, not just men reprimanding men here. <laughs> um, you're going to one another and you're talking with them and stuff. Okay. Uh, but there's, in our culture, we're kind of um, risk averse. So we really don't like to maybe be honest with people. <laughs> we, we'd rather maybe uh, not address an issue or address it maybe we hold it in until we get super mad and then let it all out at once, that kind of stuff. Um, and so there, there's just a lot of different ideas that we have about conflict that might not be overly true. Um, the first one is... Um, Everybody tell you, tells you this is how, how you can never have conflict again. You know, the pastor is here to, he's here to resolve the conflict. And, and no, this is the way to never have conflict ever again in your life. Die. That's it. As long as you live, there's going to be conflict. You don't have to like it, but you do have to learn how to deal with it, especially as Christians. If Matthew 18 is telling us, hey, you are going to be in conflict with your brother, well, then <laughs> there's not much way around that. Um, so, the, the, really, the, the thing that I want you to get about conflict is that it is inevitable. It's going to happen. It's, you, there's no hopping around in anything. And uh, there will be people you don't like in the church and out of the church, too. That's all right. Somewhere along the way, we got this idea that we have to be best friends with everybody in the church. It's not going to happen, especially as the church grows. There's going to be some people that just rub you the wrong way. There's going to be some people that you just don't get along with, people who just don't like you. And those things are okay. Okay, You have to love one another. You have to serve one another. But you don't have to be best friends with everybody. Like It's just a huge weight to have that. There can't be any conflict. We have to always get along. We have to see eye to eye on everything. Jeez, <laughs> that's, that's a really hard thing to do. Uh, it's just going to make you feel very stressed out all the time. It's, just, it's not fair to yourself or to others. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Uh, and when you're going through conflicts, the, really the biggest idea is you have to purpose to outlast the problem. You have to come to the decision that you are you're in it for the long haul. You're going to have conflict with people, okay? But when, when that happens, I'm not going to run out the door. I'm not going to chase them out the door. I'm, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Maybe we're not going to be best friends, okay? All right. But I'm not leaving. And I'm not, not chasing you off either. Does that kind of make sense? And it's one of those things with conflict that you have to cross that bridge. Because if you don't, 
you're going to go to a church and you're going to expect everybody to be best friends with you all the time and everything to go smoothly all the time. And then the instant there's any conflict, you're going to go to the next church. You're going to go to the next pastor. You're going to go to the next whatever. And it's going to be one of those things where it, conflict is going to pursue you <laughs> because <laughs> you, you can't get away from it. It's just, it, in fact, the harder you try and run, probably the worse it gets. So um, if you noticed in that passage in Matthew 18, it says, go to your brother. It's very important that you realize that you don't stop being their brother in the Lord or their sister in the Lord. You don't stop being Christians with each other, okay? We are all part of the body of Christ. Even if there's a disagreement, that doesn't mean that now I'm no longer part of the body or you're no longer. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's not like that at all. And uh, you have to realize that you're, you're going to have conflict. You're both still saved. And just because you don't see eye to eye doesn't mean that necessarily one person's wrong and one person's right. It's one of those things. We talked about this a little bit last week when we talked about the way that, you know, is it preference or is it sin? There's a lot of times that the grand majority, let's just say it like that, the grand majority of conflict in church is not based off of sin. It's based off of preference. I have these values. You have these values. And especially when you have a pastor, like, for instance, me. I came from a different church. So I have a different culture. Think of me as a uh, uh, Hispanic. And then you guys, let's, let's say that you guys are Canadian. It's a complete culture sh shock. Okay, there's going to be some adaptation that happens there. Um, and you've got to kind of roll with the punches on things. So uh, don't give up on people. Be willing to work things out. You know, we get in this idea where if I don't like somebody, uh, you can't get in that kind of mindset. Don't give up on people. Like, oh, they're just a waste of time. I'm not dealing with them anymore. Well, you shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't come to that conclusion. <laughs> So before you ever even get to a conflict, you have to accept that it's going to happen and then be willing in your heart to get over it and say, you know what, it's okay. If I don't get along with people, it's all right. We're going to get through this. And there on the slide it says that uh, purpose to outlast the problems with a good attitude. So what that looks like is oftentimes we'll do the right thing, but we'll do it grumbling. You know what I mean? Uh, there was one person I knew who... Um, they they always wanted to, um, this was a number of years ago, actually probably four or so years ago, they always wanted to help out with things. Um, maybe it was uh, cleaning the bathrooms. We had, a lot, we had this, um, the, there was this uh, Alcoholics Anonymous group that would come into the bathroom, and I don't know how, but somehow there was always pee like in the trash can, and it's poop smeared on the floor and stuff. It was very gross. Uh, it was very hard to deal with it. I know you're, when you're dealing with addicts, you kind of have to expect that kind of stuff, but it was still gross. And so we had these, th this person who uh, was volunteering to clean it, and it was great. But they always did it grumbling. Oh, these people, do do do. It's like, if you don't want to do it, <laughs> don't do it. Like, I was going to do it anyways. I really don't mind. It's just going to take me like 15 minutes to clean this. It's going to be gross, but I'll get over it. And if you're going to do it grumbling the whole time, just don't. Like, it's fine. And that's my policy with, like, pretty much everything. Like, I just don't mind doing the work myself, especially if it's not going to involve complaining. But when people do something and like, oh, you're so lucky to have me. I'm God's gift to the church. It's like, oh, oh great. Can, uh, does it have a return with it or do I need the receipt? Or <laughs> uh, and, uh, oh, I always do the right thing. Nobody cares. They're so rude. Another bad day. Well, I mean, obviously, if you go to it with that mindset, it is going to be another bad day. Just because you have conflict doesn't mean it's a bad day. just means you had conflict. Um, I, I know for those of us who are, mar who are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have a conflict with your spouse. That's okay. You don't hate each other. Just the honeymoon phase is over. It's, it's all right. For those of you who didn't hear, he said that he uh, is nine years sober from alcohol. And how he used... Yeah, and how he used to deal with uh, his conflict is just go out and get drunk. So thank you for sharing that, Danny. Uh, okay, so uh, the church is an amazing thing. It's God's idea, obviously, but it's a really good idea. And, you know, it, it's one of those things where the church can be such a, such a great thing. I mean, where else can we have a place of fellowship where we're here for each other and we're here to care for each other? You know what I mean? Uh, it's 
it's it's better than the Lions Club. The the church is just a, a fantastic. It's a fantastic thing. We get to worship together, grow together, share our lives together. This is a great thing. Um, unfortunately, sometimes throughout church history, it's kind of turned into a dark thing. <laughs> like, uh, you know, maybe for instance, the whole, uh, you know, medieval thing with Jerusalem and so that probably wasn't the best <laughs> period of church history. Or maybe in recent years how it's kind of become, you know, everybody watch church from your home and stuff. Different things like that have kind of made it less special. But the church really is a special thing. And it definitely worth saving and definitely worth, you know, giving to. I I know a lot of people say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And I understand what they're saying, but the Bible actually literally tells us as Christians to go to church. (laughs) So you might not have to to be saved, but if you're saved, you really ought to obey God when he tells you to do something. I mean, I feel like it's one of those things where, I mean, if he told you to do it, you probably should. Like, I don't have to get baptized to be saved, but I'm saved, so I should probably get baptized. Like, one of those things. Um, People will make mistakes. They are going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. People around you are going to make mistakes. It's all right. There's this idea that it's not fair. They didn't do it right. Here's the thing. Buckle down, guys. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes with how I treat you guys. I'm going to make make mistakes with how I make decisions. I'm going to make mistakes. Don't worry about it. You will too. It's going to be okay. We'll get through it. One limpy step at a time. And it's going to be okay. That's part of the part of the way of conflict. Um, and the, the real the real problem is everybody focuses on the mistake. Okay. Don't do this, right? We have church policies, right, so that people don't do this, whatever that is. You have a bad experience with somebody, you make a whole church policy on it so it never happens again. We always want to make sure we never make that mistake again. But what's way more important than the mistake, and I want you guys to write this down. It's not on your sheet, but I want you to write it down. What's more important than the mistake is how you respond to it. It's more important how you respond to the mistake than that you made the mistake. Make sense? Think about your kids. Okay, your kids make a mistake. You don't make fun of them and beat them down. And you know, No. You, you help them to grow and learn and mature and you move on. Same exact thought. Um, uh, really, that's, that's how, it <laughs> how it should be anyways. I remember there was this... There was this <laughs> oh, man. It's funny you get so stressed out when you're going through the situation, but then afterwards you're like, ah, oh, I'm glad I'm not in that situation. There was this there was this woman, uh, and uh, it was really funny. Uh, she always tried to make everything a catastrophe. I remember one time I came and she's like, "Oh, oh, the, the computer got left on." I said, "Yeah, I was doing some, it was doing some updates overnight. That's why I'm here this morning. Turn it off. Not a big deal." Oh, okay. The coffee was left in the coffee pot. I said, "No, nah, that's okay. Just leave it there. I'll clean it when I'm, before when I'm done here with the computer." Well, the office door was left open. I was like, it, "It's it's all right. Like it, oh, it doesn't matter." She's like, "Oh, you don't want to lock?" I said, "No." It, it's fine. Like, if you want to lock it, that'll make you feel better. Go ahead. But it's, it's fine. The way that that church was done, you had to go through all the other locked doors to get to that one unlocked door. So it really wasn't that big of a deal because there were, like, four people with a key. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't feel like it's that big of a t- catastrophe. And um, she always had this chip on her shoulder. But, the, ah, ah. but here's the thing. I, w- I was able to respond well to her. And that was good, and I learned how to deal with that conflict because, now check this out, she would have sucked me into her if I hadn't have dealt with it. See what I mean? Just because somebody else thinks something is a, is a national emergency doesn't mean you have to hop on board the bus and take offense at it. You know what I mean? There's going to be people who come and say, this happened, and you need to be upset. And it's like, no, oh, okay. No, I'm, I'm okay. And if you look at the culture, that's really a lot of what's going on around us, too where people are constantly trying to suck us into these different conflicts. Uh, so just a few more things I want to mention. Okay, and I'm going to go through these real quick. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll stop. Okay. Life is conflict. Ever seen a tree grow out of a rock before? Life is conflict. Have you ever seen a baby get born before? Life is conflict. It's the way of life to deal with conflict. In order for Jesus to save us, what did he do? Did he just say, bippity boppity boop? No, there was a conflict. He came, he lived, 
He died, conflict with the world, resurrected, ascended. One day he's going to come back again. There is a process there of conflict. By nature, Jesus has conflict with our hearts. People always say, trust your heart, follow your heart, believe, believe in yourself. And all this. I know it's in me, and it's not good. <laughs> I don't need to believe in myself. Jesus is really the only hope that I have for any of this. And a conflict with, will either be an opportunity for you or a gate for you. It'll make you better or it'll make you bitter. It's up to you whether you let it be an opportunity or whether you see it as, oh, there's no hope here. It's really up to you. You're going to have to go through it either way. It's like the book of Proverbs says, if you become wise, it's for yourself. If you learn how to deal with conflict, it's for yourself. In con uh, we are going to be in conflict with culture, in conflict with kids, our spouse. I mean, think about raising kids as basically a battle of the wills. I mean, let's be honest here. They want to do what they want to do, and you don't want them to do <laughs> what they want to do because their ideas are terrible. Their ideas involve things like, like, let me take my bike up on my roof and, and you know, bike off the, I'm going to fly to the moon or something. And you're like, no, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. And uh, conflict is neither good nor bad. I know a lot of people run from conflict. I don't want to deal with that. I, I don't want to have to, e most people are like that. Don't, don't feel silly. Most people are like that. Um, but conflict itself is neither good nor bad. It just is. Um, sometimes conflict produces good things, and sometimes it produces bad things. You know, I mean, look at Jesus where he goes into the temple, and he starts throwing over tables of the tax collectors. I would say that's a little bit confrontational. <laughs> uh, you know, I was thinking the other day about the difference between men and women, uh, and uh, I was able to summarize it like this. A man wrote the song, I Did It My Way. <laughs> Frank Sinatra, you guys remember that song? I did it my way. You remember? <laughs> uh, that's the difference between a man and a woman. <laughs> a woman never would have written that. Our response is what makes conflict either rewarding or not. And with that, um, with that woman that I mentioned the story of, that she was... Uh, kind of going from thing to thing, trying to make everything a catastrophe. I didn't get bent out of shape, and I was able to bring peace to the situation with others because I didn't allow myself to get caught up into it. See what I mean? There's going to be a lot of things where you, you're going to feel yourself start getting like more and more irritated. You're going to feel it like in your fingers and here, this part in your back here where you just feel more and more tense. Maybe you're going to have a hard time sleeping. Your chest is going to feel a little bit tight. You're, you can just feel your blood pressure going up. That's an opportunity for you to just kind of Take a step back, calm down, you know, it's okay. And, and so because of that, when I when I corrected her, of course I was going to have to correct her. There was going to be a situation that was an unavoidable conflict as a pastor. I couldn't have ignored it and let it go. It, would, it wouldn't have happened. It, it had to have been addressed. So when that conflict inevitably happened, I was able to talk to her with respect, and I had a good attitude the whole time. Because I didn't allow myself to get all bent out of shape about it. See what I mean? Now, I wish that I could say every time I've dealt with conflict, I've done the exact same thing. But I haven't. And I won't. Because I'm not perfect. And that's kind of what I want you guys to get. Okay? Learn from conflict. Grow from conflict. But don't hold yourself up to an impossible standard. Jesus never once said in this passage in Matthew 18, he never once said you had to do everything right. Just that you had to be willing. That's a whole pa the whole idea behind Matthew 18, the idea that you have to be willing. Go to your brother. It's Jesus calling. Your ministry will either be increased or depleted from conflict. Your ministry is going to be increased or depleted from conflict. I, uh, you guys hopefully know by now that I was a worship leader. So wh what that looked like is conflict. I had different people on my worship team, right? I had to manage 15 different things. So what happened in that is oftentimes um, I had things waiting for me when I got to church <laughs> and things that popped up throughout the week. And if I handled it well, well, then th things would go well moving on. But when I handled, handled things poorly, it affected other things later, later on. Make sense? Uh, what I'm saying is this. You really have to make sure, kind of check how you talk to people. So how do you handle ongoing, unresolved conflicts in your life? What is your trick? What do you do? 
when the conflict is not going to go away, how do you deal with it in your life? Maybe I'll give you guys some some uh, some examples. Uh, will you go to a job that maybe you're not too crazy about, and there's a lot of maybe work stress there? Um, you go to church, and there's someone that you just really don't get along with, and you're trying to pretend like you do get along with them. <laughs> so you keep the smile going, but you you know that you're not really getting along with them. Uh, that kind of stuff. So how do you handle ongoing unresolved conflicts? What? The the bullet? Are you talking about a bullet? <laughs> okay, all right, yes. <laughs> that is one way, Rick, but I honestly don't believe you because I don't believe that uh I'm just not buying it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I like your idea. I like your creativity. <laughs> good, good. Does anybody have any less violent options? <laughs> Sorry? Prayer, all right. Is there anything more you want to say about that? No? <laughs> You're not going to get stuck in a pickle there, are you? <laughs> awesome. How do you resolve, how do you uh, handle ongoing unresolved conflict, just this constant annoyance in your life? Talk it out? Yep. And roll with me on this, guys, okay? I'm, I'm liking what you're saying, so don't think that I'm disagreeing with you guys. What if you do talk to them, it still doesn't go, it still doesn't work out, and you have to deal with this every single day? You've tried talking it out, you've tried, you've tried praying, it just keeps dragging on and on and on. Yeah, you, you've tried trying to restore people, it still just keeps going on. What do you do then? Then you use <laughs> Rex 357. Um, if I may ask, Maria, you, you, can, you, can, you don't have to answer this, it's just... You can say pass, and it'll be totally fine. Um, I would consider dealing with liver disease an ongoing conflict that's unresolved. So how do you ha handle that and manage it? Okay, so prayer and reminding yourself. Controlling your thoughts, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Maria. Uh, so she said, for those of you who didn't hear her, maybe she said prayer a lot. <laughs> she said prayer quite a bit. <laughs> and she said reminding herself about the situation and whatnot, uh, which probably helps you to be a little more empathetic too. Uh, and then there was one more thing that you said that I wanted to highlight. Um, I forget exactly the wording, so I'll just kind of make it up as I go, okay? Uh, she was talking about the way that she um, would kind of... Uh, Remind yourself about the fact that, 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 that Rick, I mean, sorry, that Joe, sorry, you're Rick, that Joe, uh, you know, isn't all there, and she's responsible for being the caretaker and stuff. Um, yeah. Is there, uh, before we move on, is there, is there any, is there any things that you do to help yourself kind of de-stress from it, like, let go a little bit? So she said she likes listening to music, she has a prayer room. And uh, she tries to keep things kind of calm. And then she mentioned also about trying to, you know, maybe rub them and stuff. So uh, the next question there, uh, where is it? Okay, so most people shut down or get bitter. Um, and it gets to be where you have a weight upon a weight. So when you have unresolved conflict among unresolved conflict, it gets to be where it feels like a constant weight upon a weight, where you kind of just um, kind of start to lose your mind a little bit. <laughs> uh, and uh, so last week, we talked about the way that conflict is life tension. We can summarize conflict, we can define it as simply life tension. And we mentioned the difference between preference or sin. Um, and much of, uh, much of conflict will not be open and shut finished. If you don't handle it, it will handle, handle you. You know what I'm saying? Most conflict in your life is not going to be open and shut. Most of the time, it's going to be kind of an ongoing thing. Let's, I'll give you some examples. You have a conflict with this person. You address it. You work through it. Then everything's fine. You never have a bad attitude ever again. No. Uh, then you have to watch your attitude that it doesn't come back. See what I mean? You have to kind of work through it. You, you, now you know that you, that might happen again, and so you kind of get a little bit defensive and like, oh, no, what if, what if I start getting a bad attitude again? And, 
See what I mean? It's this constant struggle, which is, I think, why it's all the more important what uh, what Maria said about, you know, ending the day with, with prayer. Really get back on God's page, you know. Um, okay. And if you don't handle it, it will definitely handle you. Uh, we're going to look at three answers to conflict. Scripture gives three answers. Not always should we confront con- conflict, but neither should we always run and avoid it. Sometimes you have to just let things go. Um, I can think of numerous numerous situations um, as, a, as an associate pastor where there were things that were very troubling that we had to just kind of let it go. And uh, you can't always deal with every single thing. You know, like sometimes there'll be two people in the church in conflict. Very, very common. You want to go in and you just want to to fix it. You need to grow up. You need to keep your mouth shut. And you, ah, problem solved, right? No, it doesn't work like that. Really, the only thing you can do is embrace that there is a conflict and just kind of, okay, here we are. So the first, the first of the three answers for conflict is to embrace it. Uh, if we look at John sixteen thirty three, it says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So uh, is, does, can anybody think of some life tensions in your life uh, that you must embrace rather than deal with? Sorry? <laughs> she said, my mother-in-law. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> you. <laughs> my wife is taking is trying to help take care of my father-in-law who just got out of heart surgery. And uh, my mother-in-law thinks that she's <laughs> to keep like putting him back to work, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, so she keeps asking him to do stuff like, "Hey, can you grab that heavy box off that, off that shelf?" And so my my wife's all, "Oh no!" You know, I was like trying to, trying to get in there and stop it before <laughs> before it happens. I'm just thinking, "Yep, that's why I moved out of my parents' house. <laughs> that's exactly the reason there." <laughs> so, anyways, uh, life tension that you have to embrace. Yeah, Denny, go ahead. <laughs> Now, j- just to make sure that I heard you right, you're saying the conflict of, of your sister watching out for you pretty much? Ah. Yeah, I'm the youngest of five. I totally get it. <laughs> totally get it. Um, anybody else have life tension that you can think of? Uh, Shane, go ahead. Yup, that's actually on my note right here. You and me, man. Eye to eye, bro. Anybody else? Well, I tell you, if you're in any sort of ministry whatsoever, there's life tension you're going to have to embrace. The tension of just being in charge of something. It's not something that is easy, but it's something that you have to be okay with. So some things that I wrote down, people that annoy you. There's nothing you can do. There's going to be people that annoy you, and there's absolutely nothing you can do. You have to embrace that. It's a reality of life. Um, you have to accept it. Job irritations. Uh, family. Difference of opinion, <laughs> be it political or otherwise. Uh, there was, um, <clears throat> going back to that woman that I've mentioned a couple times that, you know, she was cleaning but kind of just ma- trying to make everything a catastrophe. Uh, I had to accept what was happening because it was just too stressful. Otherwise, you just sit there and you just, uh, how can I get this to go away how can i get her to stop acting like this and you you can't so you're just sitting there like getting yourself more and more worked up you can't change who somebody else is and i think that that's one of the hardest things as a pastor because you know that you're responsible for preaching the word okay let's do a bible study let's learn and somewhere in there you get this idea that it's my job to change somebody's hearts right my sermons are going to change no no I preach the gospel. God changes the heart. It's just like with worship. When, when I was in worship, people would say this. You really, you really open, open, the, what did they say? They said, you've probably heard something like this, uh, Melissa. You've uh, really opened the, opened the doors of heaven or, or brought in the presence. I think that's what they said. Brought in the presence of God. And no, no, no. Hebrew says that Jesus did that. See, it's not my responsibility to bring in the presence of God. Not my responsibility as a worship leader. See what I mean? Uh, it's not Melissa's responsibility either. That's just not her job. 
her job is to help us to sing songs, that's it. <laughs> like, that's it. Like, she doesn't have to, you know, be the world's Dove Award winning artist. She doesn't have to do that. Well, it's already out there, Melissa. You can't take it back now. And so once I, uh, once I was able to embrace it, I was able to see clearly. If you go to marriage with the idea that me and, me and my spouse will never have conflict, we'll always go to bed each night with like everything taken care of, we'll always see eye to eye, we'll, we, we'll be, it's just not going to happen. You have to embrace the fact you're going to have difference of opinion. You're going to do things differently. When you have kids, it really gets complicated because you always have different ideas of how to handle the kids. And that's just something you have to embrace that and live with it. So then uh, the second of the three answers to conflict, resolve it. This is what Gordon mentioned. And if you look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, we just read it. Uh, Darla, would you mind reading that, please? So this would be something that you do have to resolve. And uh, so what are some life tensions or conflicts that, that you must resolve in your life? Can you think of anything? You can't just embrace it. You have to resolve it. Morgan. So you're talking about like an inner dialogue? No, they're toxic. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Right. While still accepting the fact that you won't always agree when you resolve it right just making sure we're all on the same page here guys okay so uh some things that um that i thought of if you've ever run a business i don't know if you guys ever have but when you when you run a business you have different things like you have your marketing department and your different you know and stuff like that and everybody kind of there's already a conflict between all the different departments in the business but then you have, like, staff that's causing problems. Maybe everybody's not really seeing eye to eye on stuff. Um, like, how many times have you gone into a business and the secretary is just a mess, right? Like, they answer the phone, terrible representation of the business, and you're just like, wow, I hate dealing with, with this company. I will never deal with them again because of the secretary. It has nothing to do with the work that they offer. The secretary is a pain. See what I mean? And uh, so staff that's causing problems, it has to be resolved. You can't just... Let that secretary keep ruining the business. Um, conflict with wife or kids, that has to be resolved. Um, or conflict with others. Uh, bad attitudes, bad attitudes have to be resolved. You can't just let your bad attitude go. Um, bad situation you're putting yourself into. Um, <laughs> Ooh, this one. Uh, that, that, that woman, there was, there, was a, there was a stage in the conflict where I was trying to be best friends with her. And I tried so hard to help her change like, I wanted her to change, that, um, you know, I was just kind of wasting my time. I had to accept who she is, forgive her, get over myself, but then I had to also keep the distance because we would never be besties. I would never be able to go to her with the things that were weighing heavy on my heart. I would never be able to go to her and ask her for prayer about a personal issue. That was just, it was never going to happen. And... Once I realized that point, I was able to just resolve it to the best of the ability and then move on. Especially pastors are masters of this. They find the most disgruntled people in the church, and then they enforce like 90% of their time into those people. And they get like zero return. So they're just like, oh, I hate ministry. No, you just hate dealing with people who have decided that they're not going to change. Like I, I was telling you about this last week, that, that person on the worship team who they decided they were not going to change. You had, there has to be a conflict there. It has to be resolved. You can't just let it go. Um, and then uh, the last of the three answers to conflict, and we better wrap things up here. Uh, use it. Use it. In a phenomenal book uh, called Harnessing the Power of Tension, Dr. Sam Chand talks about these, thing, these three things uh, in great length, and I, and I really enjoyed it. I thought I'd pass it on to you. Um, and Psalm 119.71 says, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. And, and 2 Corinthians 1, nine. indeed we felt we had received the sentence of death, but, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. On both of these verses, they're talking about something that happened, a tension that was there, 
that the the who the person all that either the psalmist or Paul was able to use that tension for a good thing. So we won't be able to go to the go to the discussion on this. I'll just kind of throw out the things that I wrote down. Um, someone who gripes or contradicts and complains all the t- times and time makes me give more thought to my lessons. See that? As a pastor, I can't get rid of every single person who's going to complain and disagree and complain. I can't do that, right? Like. <laughs> First off, we all do that at one point. Second off, that's not really what it is to be a pastor. You can't just pick and choose who you have in your church. Like, oh, I don't like them, so they're not here. Like, you, you can't do that. And uh, so what, what you can do is from that, you can learn how to make your lessons better. You can anticipate things better. You can research better. You can think outside the box. If you only have people in your church who think that you're the greatest thing in the world, your lessons are going to be very shallow, very shallow. Um, thankfully, I haven't gone a whole lot of my life. Most of my years in ministry have been very difficult. So I, I'm used to that. And I, it's not like uh, that, you know, uh, that high school, you know, ah thing. I, I'm, I'm kind of used to it at this point. So I'm able to kind of anticipate it more. Uh, making a mistake uh, teaches me another way it doesn't work. Whenever I make a mistake, I realize it's not the end of the world. It teaches me another way it's not going to work. And uh, it teaches me to do it right. How are you going to possibly learn how to do something right if you don't try? Like my, my kids, right? How do they learn typically? How do they learn how to do something? Do I tell them and they just do it? No. I tell them 100 times, they do not figure it out. They do it themselves, they mess up four or five times, and then they figure it out, right? Like that's just how it goes. Like, yes, you still teach them. Go ahead, uh, Rick. Harnessing the power of tension. I have it in my office if you'd like to see it. 72, 119.72. And then uh, if there's someone who is upset with me, it helps me question my motive, right? If people are in conflict with me, that helps me question my motives, right? If everybody thinks I'm the greatest thing in the world or I only surround myself with yes men, I never have a chance to grow and learn. See what I mean? So uh, if someone's upset with me, I, I'm able to question my motives and focus and prepare way better. Um, and so we're going to actually stop there. I want to make sure that we don't go long.